A young man, killed in the prime of his life while trying to reach a loved one, is reborn when a spirit drags him from beyond the veil of death while granting him magical powers and thrusting him into a larger fight than previously realized. And although a decent enough story that while not missing anything doesn't hold anything of major substance until the end, and running through a world that is beautiful in a bleak sort of way. If you thought I was talking about Shadow of Mordor, I wouldn't have been shocked. After all, my description is vague enough that it could apply to that game as well. But we are not Captain Talion of the Black Gate, but Akito, an aggressively normal but down on his luck young man. And we have not been possessed by Celebrimbor, the Bright Lord and Ringmaker, but a slightly rough around the edges supernatural detective and Ghostbuster. And the land we travel alone is not Mordor where shadows lie, but instead Shibuya Tokyo. But looking beyond this little opening bit, let's go on a journey together to try and parse out my thoughts on this game, Ghostwire Tokyo. Ghostwire Tokyo is a strange game for me, because it is both better and worse than it could have been in different aspects of each, leaving my final thoughts right in the middle. The world of Ghostwire is one of the best I've seen, and if you told me this was a two-scale recreation, I would believe you. After spending over 20 hours wandering the streets and looking about all the rooftops and alleys with seeming no corners cut, to the authenticality and design of the world. But then, we have what I've taken to calling Ubi-esque design, with map markers littering every inch of the world, for those with completionist tendencies to chase after ceaselessly, like a dog going after its tail. And then there's a combat system, which, after removing the flashing lights and hand gestures, you're left with a mediocre FPS game with little substance and no reason to delve deeper than the surface of, lest you throw more difficulty on yourself than needed. The world is breathtaking to wander through, with paper signs and neon lights everywhere, giving a rather unique world to explore. Along your wanderings, pieces of what life was here before the sudden misty rapture are shown, as piles of clothes where people stood while bringing their groceries home, hanging out with friends, or just wandering the market streets, now filled with nekomata, feline merchants of fine wares, if you have coin, which can be found in floating pots all about the world, for you to punch and collect those coins within, along with ammunition. The animals, a bit low quality in the graphics department, seem to be the only ones left that aren't the strange, ghostly visitors who go about collecting souls for their greater plan. The dogs seem to be just sitting in place where their owners disappeared from, and if we feed them, are willing to lead us to prizes, mainly coins. And then the feline inhabitants seem to be doing just fine. Occasionally, they even offer to adopt you and KK, proving that yes, cats are in fact better than dogs. And then we have the visitors, wandering the streets and collecting the souls of those who got raptured, frozen in place, and more often than not, somewhere in the air. Each have a relatively unique design to them, making them stand out, more often than not, are very recognizable at a glance, from Slenderman and his small army of cousins who became businessmen and law enforcement to the dozen or so school uniforms that run about and throw math supplies at you, potentially giving flashbacks of geometry and calc classes, to the rare but extremely dangerous ice woman who can freeze you in place or rip KK from you, making you have to reconnect quickly or die. Each have their own attack patterns that, while recognizable, are difficult to parry and rarely worth the effort as an imperfect parry will result in damage bleeding through and you being thrown off kilter, which can lead to a constant loop of you being damaged before you can actually get another attack in. So it is better to just keep backing away, creating distance, and sending out water waves, which, if done right, 
will push them away and almost always open up their cores to grab and banish with little risk to yourself. But in this world, there are a million things to be seen, pulling you in every direction at once. Spirits asking you to do anything from hand them a roll of toilet paper to ridding someone of a curse that they had plaguing them long before the fog came and raptured everyone. But either way, both of these will put the spirits at ease so they can pass on and we can collect them. Another side activity is Tanuki. They'll be hiding about wherever, disguised as objects, normally with a tail. Upon finding them, and returning them to their band leader, will get more prizes. These Tanuki were scattered when the fog rolled over, and the visitors started prowling the streets. Yet another thing on our checklist to complete is finding creatures of Japanese folklore and banishing them. This will give us outfits, spirits, or upgrade materials in return for our efforts, and while they are short, with some leading to a spectacle across your screen, they all seem to be of the same ilk. Wander around a small area and pick up or destroy an object, or follow a ghostly apparition for a bit before doing the same actions as before. And here we have yet another staple of the Ubi-esque aspects of the game. Watchtowers, or in this case, Torrent Gates. Upon cleansing these, the fog rolls back a bit more and more items are given for us to find and collect. And here we have the most damning aspect of the Ubi-esque design. Almost all of these are marked on your map, resulting in a clutter that paralyzes you with choice and overwhelms your screen. You are told, via number on your screen, when you clear a group of spirits and absorb them with a kasashiro, or paper doll, that there are 240,000 spirits to collect, and such a large number is daunting even to a semi-completionist like me. And somehow, these aren't even all the spirits in the game. Upon looking online, it seems that even though we are told freeing them will help us against our masked foe who brought this rapture upon us, it just nets you some prayer beads after you beat the boss and a voice message from Ed, our man in the chair, who never actually talks to us, or seems to know that we are the ones doing these things always referring to us as KK. While these activities aren't particularly fun or interesting, at their very best, there's something you can do while listening to some overly long video essay about some game or show you never, and will never, play. But at worst, they require just enough of your attention that you can't simply have it as background noise, though you learn about the Lost TV show. All of these aspects massively drag the game down in a similar way to Hogwarts Legacy, which I will be discussing in a future video. Yet another issue is the story seems to be at odds with itself, telling you, hurry up, we need to stop the masked man. And then the game almost tells you right after, take your time, explore every nook and cranny, free the spirits, capture the creatures of folklore, learn way more about Japanese objects than you would ever think you would. Here's a mummified dog, resulting in me questioning if I should shotgun the plot, ignoring the side content, or wander the lovingly created streets, and feed all of the dogs I can for some spare change, as who knows, maybe this one will bring us something worthwhile. On the other hand, lifting the game up in my eyes is the story, purely because of the slight novelty I found in it, largely in part because of the ending. Akito is left alone. His mother and father died well before the game begins. KK leaves his head, going to the afterlife, finally somewhat at peace. Then there's Rinko, who we get to know throughout the missions, also dying before we can face the final boss, and our sister, who we fought so hard to save, even diving into the abyss, working countless hours and putting her life above our own, just because we care for her that much. In the end, she dies, succumbing to her injuries, as well as being used as part of a magic ritual, leaving us all alone with the veil of what really exists beyond, having been revealed to us. I feel that's what makes it unique. We start the game unbalanced, 
and not living for ourselves, doing everything we can for our sister, who we believe got hurt because of our actions, leaving no time to live our own life. And in the end, we come out perhaps a more balanced person. And while we might have been thrown into this revelation headlong by force, perhaps we also learned to never forget those who helped and loved us. But also, we need to live for ourselves, for the dead are to be remembered, not your entire life. You have to move on at some point, but not run from them, as with their passing, they're a part of you now. Their memories and teachings will always be alongside you, guiding us forward. And while this story seems to be wonderfully crafted, a story can only do so much with unenjoyable gameplay beneath it. And when this game isn't being a flashy FPS with a side of rock, paper, scissors, or an unbearable collect-a-thon, it has something almost fairly poignant to say. But to get to these moments, you need to run through hours upon hours of almost mind-numbing content through some of the most wonderfully lifelike streets ever created. You can catch magnificent looking set pieces mixed with barely passable movement mechanics to navigate this world. Flashy and entertaining looking combat that feels too floaty and is damn near impossible to aim on a controller while using a mouse is somehow even worse as a sensitivity is so slight if you so much as tap your mouse you might as well start spinning in place. An interesting, and maybe even thought-provoking story has been stretched almost to the breaking point over enough bloat to fill multiple Ubisoft titles. It's like the dream of someone which was taken from them at the last second and changed just enough that they can't truly call it their own anymore. Which wouldn't surprise me if that were the case. But throughout all this, I'm still not sure where to really place my thoughts on it. There's so much bad, no, not even bad, just middling and mediocre content that what positives there are are almost drowned out. But when the game takes a moment not to force collectibles down your throat, not to force you into combat, towards the end, there's a magnificent set piece almost exploration of moments that while i won't spoil i think truly show part of what this game really could be which leaves me in a strange place in terms of my final thoughts on it does the quality of the pieces i enjoy outweigh the sins of the whole and if it does where do i even place that while I believe that these spoons don't weigh out the banes that are in this game, they do tip the balance more towards the good in this case. And to be fair, I would put this game out of solid 5 out of 10. A middling experience that while I remember fondly, always comes with a caveat when I'm talking about it. The magnificent story beats towards the end that you have to go through so many Tory gates to finish. The amazing world with a movement system that doesn't let you explore it to its fullest. And something that I do feel is worth mentioning. I got this game for free on Epic during one of the many sales, which I will fully admit has colored my opinion of it for the better, as I didn't have to spend a penny on it and I still get to experience it. So in the end, I believe this game is a mess. A mess with some of the best world design, but has enough baggage that not even an airport could destroy it all. So I suppose my thoughts really haven't been cleared up all that much. It's a decent game, but there's enough questions that I'll have to revisit this in the future. As a note, it does come on Xbox Game Pass, so I would give it a try there and decide for yourself and let me know what you think about Ghostwire Tokyo. Thank you for watching. Please do leave your thoughts down below, as, like I said, I'm having trouble parsing out my own. Let me know if there's any game 
you want me to talk about, and I might cover that one next. So, until next time, I'm Sven, and this is Alvin Prince, signing out.